There are some pictures of spiders, snakes, and lizards in this talk, as well as birds. So tough. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't think we can give you a heads up as to where they are, but um, yeah, if you're particularly worried about spiders and snakes, maybe cover your eyes until we start talking on each slide. Okay. So, do you want to go or? So, 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 uh, so uh, the original advertisement for this talk was was Romania and Dominica, but we, it turns out we had too many pictures to to really do to do both. So we stuck to to Dominica because it's a bit more exotic. And these were both uh, expeditions with Opwell or Operation Wallacea, which is a well, say says on the screen conservation research organisation that basically does education expeditions. So it does do quite a lot of scientific work and quite a lot of also engagement work on the ground in various countries. And one of the places they operate oh, is, Dom well, they operate in all these countries around the world, but say one of the places they operate in is Dominica in the Caribbean, in the Lesser Antillian, Lesser Antilles Isles, which are kind of the islands stretching up from South America, North South America to the, the larger islands in the middle of the Caribbean. So um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Dominica, uh, we thought we'd do a quick Google map of the area. Um, the points on here are purely points that we will kind of be talking about during our talk. Um, we didn't get to see much of the island in the two weeks we were there. Um, it's only about 29 miles from north to south, um, but the airport, which is in the top there, Douglas Charles Airport, it takes about an hour and a half to get from that point to Pont Casse, which is the central uh, roads where all the roads meet in the middle of the island. And then it took about another 45 minutes to get from Pont Casse down to Three Rivers Eco Lodge, turning off the main road. Um, and you'll see why in a second. Um, so yeah, so the roads are not great they're very twisty turny uh very windy and um not in a very good state of repair um, sure, sure. come which, to in a moment yes we'll come to in a second um so yeah so this just kind of gives you an idea of where places where so ireland is in the north they have two uh, international islands uh Airport. air islands airports um so they have one in the north and one at the capital russo um we spent our first week at Three Rivers Eco Lodge, and then we spent our second week at Pont Casse. Um, and then the other places are just kind of places that we went to on little excursions and day trips. So this was the first view that we had of Dominica flying into the airport, just about to land. So excuse the kind of slightly blurry image because it's through the plane. Um, but you'll notice that the rainforest doesn't look in too good a shape and the reason for that <laughs> is in 2017 uh dominica was hit by hurricane maria it's a category five hurricane and the reason you might have heard of that one is it also hit puerto rico and that has caused a devastation there as well so what's it so so it was hit by winds of same speeds of up to 165 miles per hour that literally defoliated the entire island all the leaves were lost but a third of the trees were, were were lost full stop, and the, well, more almost hundred percent of the buildings on the island were damaged, and many were destroyed, and so the economy was wrecked, and so utterly devastated by by this event. Now, Opwell had started expeditions a couple of years beforehand, and so part of the reason and. Potentially, that would be the reason to abandon it as, as not being worth it. But part of the reason for doing this work is they are seeing how and if the island acts biodiversity actually recovers from this massive hit. And that was part of what we were doing. And it also provides an income as well for the locals, which is badly needed because Dominica is a very tourist driven uh, island. So, but not a no well known one at yeah. the same time. So, so not many tourists are going there at the moment because they've lost the infrastructure so by having groups of students going there and international kind of staff volunteers going out there and doing work we're obviously spending money in the area and helping to kind of regain that the economy a little bit 
Um, so I mentioned about the uh, adventure into our first lodging. So it took about an hour and a half, uh, no, about two hours to get from the airport to the turnoff for uh, Three Rivers Eco Lodge. And this is a very short video. Well, say very short. This is a video showing the adventure into uh, along the tracks down to the Eco Lodge. Um, we didn't make this journey very often because, um, well, you'll see why. Um, the Three Rivers Eco Lodge is named because it's kind of the the confluence, the meeting point of three different rivers, which are quite sizable. Um, being in a tropical area, the rivers are prone to flash flooding when it rains, and it does rain there quite a lot. Um, so yeah you can see the track there's little fords to cross um and then you come up and all of this vegetation that you can see is um mostly native but it looks very exotic for us um there's lots of bananas and uh kind of tropical fruits there um and then you come out into this wonderful almost manicured lawn area um with some few houses um this was actually a farm they had some goats and some chickens um and then you'll notice that the people in this video are wearing what looks like climbing gear. Um, and that's because the first river that you have to cross, the hurricane wiped out the bridges. So to get across easily, they put in zip lines, um, which unfortunately we didn't get to use because we weren't deemed important enough. Um, so we had to walk across the river through, through the water. Um, and then you come up the bank and you go through this other farm area which again had goats grazing um, and kind of some sort of crops growing in there. Um, this area was quite good for bats. So we had a bat team um, as part of the work that they were doing there and they were catching bats to monitor what was going on there. Um, it's a very shaky video. We didn't take this video. We found it afterwards and thought, oh, that's a good idea um, because the adventure yeah, you can see why we didn't kind of trek all the way up to the cars um, every day. We're quite happy staying at camp at this point. Um, the area to the right of this is actually um, the area that we call the hummingbird nets, uh, which you'll see later on. Um, and then that's the remains of the bridge um, that was wiped out. So they've got a zip line across to the second side. And then you kind of go up the track and yeah, you kind of come up to the lodge um, just further up this track, which was a bit of an adventure. Um, so most of the work that we were doing from the camp was um, not all the way back at the road. Um, so the first set of nets were further up hill. Um, and then the um, second set of nets were kind of just on the other side of the river and up river slightly and then the last set of nets were kind of tucked away actually just where that green gate is um, in this slide and this is a picture of me crossing the river on a warm sunny day <laughs> the normal way of crossing the normal way of crossing with a big stick to kind of check where you're putting your feet um, thankfully there's not too many nasty things living in the river so it's perfectly safe and this was home for the first week. So we were sleeping in a tent and essentials if you're in the tropics is to have a tarp over your tent to just protect it from the rain. Doesn't help you sleep if it's raining, but it definitely helps. You still protect. have a tent. <laughs> yeah, it means the tent doesn't get battered every night. Um, and the Eco Lodge, being an Eco Lodge is very low budget, very easy going. Um, they had some resident chickens which woke us up every day and we had uh, lots of cats milling around which helped to control um, I guess the rodent population um, but they were also quite happy eating scraps from all the students. Um, this one was a particular favourite of mine. I don't like cats but this one made it, had a soft spot for. Um, and it was very, very basic accommodation. Um, they only had a few, couple of showers and because we were sharing the campsite with a lot of students at the time, uh, we thought we'd leave the showers to the students. So this was our bathing facilities. Um, so we just, you know, when you need to wash, just jump in the river. Um, and yeah, it was beautifully clear. 
um, and really, really nice and not too cold once you got used to it. So the first day, full day that we were there, um, we decided to walk up to Boiling Lake, which is the second largest natural well, boiling, boiling lake. It does what it says on the tin in, in the world. Essentially, it's a highly volcanic island and there's seven volcanoes. Yeah. And yeah, almost in the middle, there is an area, well, not quite in the southern middle, there is a, yeah. an area of particular activity, including, including this, this so called boiling lake. And this was the notice um, as you start the trail, um, which hopefully you've had a chance to read, but you'll notice that it says hikers should not attempt the trail after 10 a.m. Um, and that's because in the tropics, it gets dark um, quite early. They don't have a, a long extended dawn and dusk like we're used to. Um, and basically because of the length of time it takes to get to this lake, they recommend not starting after 10 a.m. for safety reasons, because the trail is quite difficult in places and you don't want to be doing it in the dark. Unfortunately, the geologist who was acting as our guide for this trail, uh, for this day trip, um, we were a bit late leaving because of various logistics of swapping students over and moving groups around. And we unfortunately didn't actually get to start the trail until about half past 11. So we, some of us were a little bit concerned, but we thought we'll give it a go and see how we get on. And on the way, um, as you can imagine, being a very tropical island, there's lots of amazing um, plant life. Um, the buttress roots of the trees, um, pretty much all of the big trees that were still standing were the ones that had the big buttress roots. Um, most of the other ones had been kind of wiped out by the hurricane. But there was loads of other amazing plants. Um, the bromeliads that were up in the trees often had little frogs in the, in the pools of water that were collected in there. Um, and most of the flowers that we were seeing are ones that you would expect to see in garden centers in this country. Um, quite a lot of them I recognized from people's gardens. So um, yeah, there's lots and lots of botany to kind of pay attention to. Unfortunately, neither of us are botanists, so. And we didn't have a dedicated botanist on the trip. So sadly yeah, we can't tell you yeah. about it. <laughs> Um, so these are some pictures of us heading up the trail. Um, this is kind of, I suppose, the second stage of the trail. There's four or five stages. Um, and it's just, yeah, wandering up quite steep tracks. And, and the kind of the, the, the devastation's fairly clear, and particularly in the middle photo. The, the, the right photo was, always, was quite bare anyway, so that's very natural. But yeah, there was a lot of bare branches going on in this rainforest. But you can see there is some new growth starting. So, you know, even it's been two years since we were there. So, you know, even in a few years time, hopefully it will have recovered a little bit. Um, and yeah, again, you can just see all the all the trees that have got missing. But also a lot of the greenery isn't aren't isn't exactly the trees. So it's it's the yeah, bryophytes. Bryophytes, the brute there, not bryophytes. Things that grow up trees, climbers and vines and bromeliads and all those sort of plants. Epiphytes, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, epiphytes. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry, but this area was say this is this is a volcano, albeit not a particularly active one. And and say there were rising to quite high peaks. The, the highest mountain on the island was about 1,400 meters, so reasonable size, particularly by our standards. And part of and we were going basically around this was part of the, the idea. Yeah. So I actually turned back with a couple of the other girls um, around this point. So I can't remember if I took this one or if you took this one, but I turned back around this point because we decided that there was no way we were going to get there and be able to get back in, in daylight. Um, Hugh decided to go on a little bit more with the rest of the group and got to. So the other side of the ridge was the Valley of Desolation. And so a set of uh, hot springs, which I'll show you in a moment. But in the far distance, there is kind of a wisp of cloud or rather steam. And that is actually the Boiling Lake a couple of miles away. But the, the path that had just come down to to get to this point was extremely treacherous. 
And yeah, I didn't fancy risking that if we were going to have less daylight. But anyway, so these are hot springs. So this is, yeah, just the short clip that he took of the hot springs. And I'd, I'd never seen, seen, seen this before. So <laughs> rather cool. Um, and yeah, as you can imagine, with it being volcanic, it did smell quite a bit. Okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, very sulfuric. Um, but say I turned back at that point. So the the people we were with, who say fishing video, they did get there, but they did also get back to British civilization in the dark. So yeah, but this is this is the Boeing Lake, which we didn't see. <laughs> One day we'll go back and we'll leave a bit earlier and we'll maybe make it. Um, but yeah, so Boiling Lake is kind of a, a bit of a tourist destination, but they always say kind of make sure you wear old clothes and make sure that you plan a beach day the following day because it's quite a hard trek to get up there. And so, but but because it did turn back in reasonable time, it did more chance to actually look at the forest itself. Yeah, that's the first. Um, so the next day after we'd done our um, slightly failed trip up to Boiling Lake, we went um, to check out the nets at uh, our first site, which was just up river or up the hill from our camp. And this is Hugh walking up the trail to go and set some nets. And you'll notice that there is a lot of grassy stuff growing up the trees um, and this is actually a invasive um, plant that was brought in by the hurricane it wasn't recorded on the island before the hurricane so it either got blown in or it got washed up sh offshore um, by the hurricane and this is razor, gra razor grass and it's called razor grass because the each blade of grass has silica crystals on it um, and if you were to walk into a big bundle of it um, well you'd get stuck it's very hard to break free from it um, or to push through it and it cuts just like glass um, so as with anywhere in the tropics long sleeves and long trousers were essential um, but they were definitely needed um, when we were working in these areas Thankfully, we didn't have to do too much kind of pushing through it because the, when we're setting the nets, they're on already mostly open bits of trail anyway. Um, so we didn't have to do too much clearing of this. But aside from the, the, the sheer inconvenience sometimes to get around it, part of the issue is it's, it's taking over the undergrowth. So the next one. Mm. So a lot, so it means that it's a lot less open than it should be naturally. Which doesn't mean which one of the issues for us of bird rigging is that we were we were rigging at we were at a low level. Next one. But a lot of the birds, because of the vegetation, were actually going at much higher level. So our sampling wasn't necessarily achieving that much. It was slightly frustrating. But what they use is a system of uh, transects and basically it's basically the tracks radiating out, radiating out from, from base. And every 500 meters there was basically a sampling point. And they were looking at the vegetation structure and uh, invertebrates was probably the most important things they were doing in the expedition full stop because that's the best way of gauging recovery but also they were sampling bats we were doing bird ringing and well, habitat ha surveys. say habitat surveys more generally there were other bits of research going on, on the islands uh, uh, freshwater ecology sampling and uh, reef, coral, reef, coral reef work and things as well we didn't get to do that bit. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so this is Hugh um, returning from an empty net, uh, which became a rather common sight, unfortunately. But we did catch some birds. Um, so I've I've posted this and I haven't labeled this bird for a reason, um, because hopefully you might look at it and think, oh, that looks kind of familiar. Um, and hopefully some of you might think, oh, it looks a bit like a wren. And you'd be right. Um, so this is a house wren, or more more specifically, a southern house wren, and quite possibly 
a species or at least a species its own right. House wrens are slightly complicated. But yeah, it's a little bit large, larger and fatter than our wren, but otherwise it's a pretty normal wren. Um, but yeah, the first bird of the trip, Hugh was very excited by because... Um, he... uh, I had encountered some of the other species before, so this was another one for... <laughs> yeah, so Hugh got to ring the first bird um, because he thought, oh, this is nice. It's a new bird uh, to add to my list. And I think they did, af not long after we got back, they did actually confirm that they have split well, into a separate depending race. depending on who you read. Yeah. It's definitely a separate subspecies, but it might be more than that. So a lot of the work that we were doing, um, the first net set that we had didn't wasn't particularly successful. I think the house wren was the only bird we caught there. Um, but we decided to set some nets around the camp as well. Um, there was a bit more open space um, where the students went, pitched in their tents, and we thought we'd catch some birds there. So this is us doing a bit of an impromptu demo for some of the staff who had got up early <laughs> to, to come and watch us. Um, and Hugh is here ringing a lesser Antillian bullfinch. They're rather smart birds, albeit. This one was was heavily in molts, and this is this is an adult male at the end of the breeding season, and yeah, molting out all its its destroyed plumage essentially. And I say energy of now for the contrast. So this bird is was pretty much fresh out of the nest. It's not long fledged, and these were quite quite common on the islands. Indeed, this this species and some related species are quite common in the islands in the Caribbean, some of the Caribbean islands. The other really common species that we caught were banana quits. And this is me doing a banana quit impression, um, holding one. They, they're they not, I wouldn't say they're, they're sad looking birds, but they kind of have that kind of slightly downturned beak, which makes them look a little bit sad. Um, but yeah, banana quits come in a lot of different uh, shapes, sizes and colors, even for the same species. Um, so the two, uh, that we're holding here. The one on the top is an adult male and the one on the right on the bottom is a female. I think was it? Youngster. That, that was a youngster. Yeah. We did I'll catch a female. Youngster, yeah. yeah. Almost, almost an adult. Um, but with the tropical birds, because they can breed most of the year, it can be quite difficult to age birds um, specifically mm. unless you catch them right out of the nest and they have a the habit nest. of bolting all their feathers <laughs> which makes them difficult. yeah but we did catch these are these are these are again are quite a common species in in the caribbean islands and also in uh yeah bits of south america and central america and lots of islands had their own subspecies or near or groups of islands had their own subspecies including this one and they're called banana quits um, because this one's sticking its tongue out at us and this is what it uses its tongue for. Um, so they aren't exactly specific on, on their, what they eat, um, but they particularly like feeding off nectar from flowers. Um, so yeah, I guess banana quits because they presumably hang out around banana plantations <laughs> as well. Um, but this one was feeding, literally this was taken from our kind of breakfast table. So, um, very, very common sight around camp. Then another common species we encountered were these. So it's a black whiskered vireo. Uh, showing off to one of our fellow staff members who were there, who was a, who was a freshwater ecologist trying to corrupt him a bit. <laughs> and these, if you're familiar with them, well, rather, if you're familiar with red eyed vireo, these are very closely related. Uh, but one of the things with Although we their residents in this particular area. And one of the things that's, that's quite clear is look at the eye colours. The ones on the top left, that's quite a sort of dull browny grey eye. And top right is red. And so that juvenile adults, it's a fa fairly clear way of, of looking at things. Uh, spider warning. Um, so there were quite a few spiders around as well. Um, I'm okay with spiders, don't particularly like them, but I'm okay if I know what they're there. Um, so this huntsman, as you can see, is tiny. Um, and this was actually found underneath one of the tables in the dining area. Um, there was a slightly larger one that used to hang out in the 
toilets um so you had to be a bit careful when you went to the bathroom in the middle of the night um and then the spiny orb weavers um very hard to find exact species um, of things in Dominica because not many people have been there and, and done any research on them. Um, but these guys are really cool and they were kind of everywhere. Um, and the spines on the sides, um, you could kind of gently pick them up by those spines and they were quite robust and you could kind of move them if you needed to. Um, so if they built a web somewhere you didn't want them, you could move the spider and then walk through the web without disturbing them too much. So this was our net second kind of Official proper sampling, uh, sampling site. Um, and you can see, again, some of the um, difficulties of ringing in a tropical area. Um, you can see there's a tree across the kind of foreground. And the transects were supposed to be three nets in a line, in an unbroken line. Um, but because of fallen trees and things like that, this was actually one net and then two other nets, um, maybe about 10, 15 meters away, um, because the trees, we, could, we couldn't cut them, the trees back. We didn't have the equipment for that. Um, but you'll also notice in this net, there is something in it. Um, the two mornings that we were there catching at this net, it didn't catch anything other than leaves. Um, so leaves fall all the time and you often spend a lot of time extracting leaves out of the nets. Um, which is fine because the leaves aren't too dangerous. So, um, you yeah, know, that's always a bonus. Um, and yeah, if, if there is anybody who is interested in finding out more about fungi or learning, discovering new species of fungi, probably, um, I'd highly recommend going there. Um, there is so much, and every day we'd be going and finding new little bits of fungi kind of popping out from the damp undergrowth and the trees and things. Um, and then the picture on the right here is of some coconuts. Um, so there are kind of palm trees and things growing within the rainforest and these coconuts had dropped and were just growing where they'd fallen, which was quite cool. And yeah, for me, the first time I'd seen wild coconuts. And one of the I suppose one of my favourite species of the one trip, of the most notable species. <laughs> where these land crabs, which are kind of everywhere, um, you know, every little hole, every little cranny, under every rock, under every tree, there would be a crab or several. Um, and the picture of me pointing is actually the crab in the top picture there, um, because it pretty much lived on this log that had fallen across the trail, um, and it was there every morning when we walked past. Um, this one, however, uh, ended up with a name. Um, this was Scuzz, and he had an attitude problem. He lived in a ditch that we had to cross in order to go and check the nets. And every time we had to cross the ditch, he would appear and do this. Um, he did grab my boots at one point. Uh, here I am rocking the trousers in socks look. Um, and I could, there was definitely some pressure there. Um, so I didn't want to put my fingers too close in case I you know, got a good nip from him. Um, but yeah, he was he was very entertaining. But although we didn't catch much of this site, the actual place where we based ourselves was on the riverside. It was great for watching birds, at least, if nothing else. So the river meant that we could actually see <laughs> chat and have a conversation. We didn't have to stay too quiet. And when the students joined us for their, um, you know, morning with us, looking about bird ringing, um, it meant that we didn't have to keep reminding them, Shh, you have to be quiet because the birds are just up there. Um, and you know, anybody who knows me knows I like to chat. So it was quite nice to just be able to <laughs> chat normally. Do you want to talk about your bird? Well, one of the <laughs> entertainments that we had was, well, we had a lot of uh, green herons. So they're quite common in the Americas, green herons flying up and down the river. And occasionally they would land and potter about. And this one bird side to, well, Say hello and look for its lunch or breakfast rather. So we we're watching this bird for a while and eventually it disappeared behind a rock. And unfortunately, say we didn't catch it, catch it. Well, we that didn't, was catching. That was catching. We didn't see that, but we did at least see that it actually caught something. So it's little fish. She was quite pleased with and sat around for a little bit digesting and then it 
flew off down the river. There were, as well as green, the, these green little green these green herons. There were some also some some large kingfishers about, although we we only saw them high up in the distance, so you never it's never managed to get a photo of them. I don't even think we could. Well, we wouldn't have even attempted to catch them. You'd have needed a can a canopy net on the end of a whoosh net. No, no, projecting but... up into the sky to catch them. Yeah. But yeah, they were very cool to see. Um, but we also had uh, entertainment from these guys, and this is actually the native Dominican uh, anole. Um, and these guys are, like I said, native, um, and they predominantly live in areas where you don't find many people, so kind of higher up the mountains, in the dense rainforests, and on the trails. Um, and later on, there is a picture of the introduced animal which is a bit of competition for them um but these guys were really entertaining um they like scurrying around they'd be eating lots of insects that were on the rocks and the trees and things um and the picture at the bottom shows the amazing dew lap that they have which they use for displaying um not entirely sure what this guy was displaying at um because there was no other animals around so maybe he just decided to show off to us um but yeah it was quite nice to see that and while we were sat on the riverbank, um, we obviously, because it was open, we could see lots of things and we kept getting buzzed by hummingbirds. Um, they were in the habit, they were clearly very curious about us and they were in the habit of coming down and flying around and checking us out and then disappearing again. Um, but this one was quite high up um, and we were able to get a few photos of it, uh, heavily cropped and heavily zoomed in. Um, so they're definitely not gonna win any prizes, but this was a green-throated carib um, which was is a fairly common kind of uh, hummingbird in the area. But another one, of this, the the quite common species that we saw at least, or never caught, was grey kingbird, which is a type of largest tarrant flycatcher. It's about the size of a starling, I would say. They were quite loud, and quite obvious, and they also often moved around and found the groups, as far as we could tell. So the yeah, the picture of three birds. There was actually probably five in this group. And they were, yeah, busy shouting at each other and mucking about while we were busy watching down the riverside. So these are quite nice. And the other thing we had that were, so there's not, there's not many birds of prey in this part of the world, but there were broad winged hawk, or it's a small buzzard essentially, and who are, they're migratory in a lot of their range, but in Dominica and a lot of the Caribbean, but they're residents. And yeah, they're rather nice birds, say at least quite small. Say they're very small for a buzzard type bird, but yeah. But we did eventually catch some hummingbirds, albeit not at that site. Yeah, so the um, the third site that we caught at again wasn't one of the official sites, um, but it's where we set our what we then termed the hummingbird nets, um, and this was. Probably the first hummingbird we came back with because we were all very excited about it. Um, and yeah, as you can see, we this is a picture of me taking a picture of Hugh holding the hummingbird, but a picture of a student taking a picture of the hummingbird. Um, so because of obviously child protection, we can't have pictures of students in in the pictures, but we did put them to good use. So there are bits of students in the pictures, but no faces. So you're OK. And we did catch quite a few hummingbirds. Um, so most of these are the green uh, throated carib, um, as you can see, because they've got green throats. But the one in the top right is a purple throated carib, which is the other um, kind of more common hummingbird species that you find there. So these, I mean, the, these are small hummingbirds, but they're not tiny hummingbirds by any standards. But what they, they've got all the fairly typical features like the, the, we, the wings being that, that quite slightly weird sickle, sickle shape. The feathers are very stiff, so that means they go into nets in odd ways. And they've got really short, tiny legs. So we couldn't actually ring these, but we, what we could do is at least show social and the students them before releasing them. And yeah, no, so, this, so I have I have encountered, well, caught hummingbirds before, but these are all, all different and so beautiful little birds. They were my first hummingbirds. I was very excited. <laughs> And then we caught one of these. Which 
took us a while to identify it because if you look at the picture on in the book on the left kind of looks like it but it's very gray and there was nowhere in the in the, in the main book for for the island was an actual well the island west indies was actually a picture of the a bird this bird and it's this color coloration we did subsequently find out that's because it's the juvenile plumage which isn't that much a shock but it, this wasn't at the time recording the bird book, so there are some new, a new book, a new edition of the same of the books which have this in properly. And these are a near endemic, so they're only found on two islands, which was see, Dominica and, and Guadeloupe. Guadeloupe. Yep. So the so the next island north of north of here. And yeah, they were quite they were nice birds. They were they were quite vocal as well. They they were they are North American. Well, they are they are. American wood warblers or species of, albeit and they're probably mo more like our warblers than, than most most warblers of the Americas. And they would say they were relatively common and doing doing well. Yeah, and they were quite curious as well. We had quite a few of them just kind of checking us out when we were sat near nets. Um, didn't catch too many of them, but there were certainly a lot of them around. So the kind of the, I guess the fourth, so the the, the common, common species we encountered were grass quits, which are well little finchy finch type things. Uh, the one on the right is a kind of it's quite a scruffy adult male, probably again probably just finished breeding and he's he's eating to molt out all his feathers. And the one on the left we think is a young male from memory. But again, it's a small finch like, but they were quite common in the kind of more open areas. And we did allow the students, this is actually a staff member, this is one of the teachers, um, but we did allow them to kind of get involved. So they would come and help us um, at the net. They would help to carry birds back uh, from the nets um, to see how we catch them and extract them. Um, and then we did allow them to help release the birds, which if anybody's been to a ring demo, we always get, we like to get volunteers out to do that. Um, so yes, yeah, so this is one of the teachers. The group that we had at this, uh, camp where was a mixed group so the majority of them were from uh, South Wales um, and then there was a very small number about five students from Canada and then about 10 students from the USA so it was a nice mixed group um, of staff and students all with different kind of areas of specialism so some were really 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 interested in the birds and others were slightly less so and especially bird ringing involves early mornings which is always a tough sell for students um and some of you might know that i did a lot of work with fly catchers um before i moved to east anglia where there's not that many um so i was really excited to try and catch one of the fly catchers that they get in dominica um as you said the, the gray king birds are a tyrant fly catcher and this is another species which we were very lucky to catch. This is a Caribbean Elenia. I think I've got that right. Um, and this one was actually a female with a brood patch. So she obviously had eggs or very young chicks not too far away. Um, so we kind of ringed her and processed her very quickly so she could get back to her, uh, to her nest. Um, interestingly, you'll see that she's got a little chip off of her bill. Um, she had a bit of a funny ridge on her bill. Um, and there was a bit of damage to that but otherwise she was in perfect health so hopefully she uh, managed to get some chicks off which was quite nice ah one of my favorites <laughs> so the so another let's say quite fa fairly common species in in both both near habitation but also out in the rainforest were tremblers so these are much, we don't particularly have any, anything closely related to them but they kind of acted like starlings and they sounded like starlings and they gripped and fought like starlings. They had a lot of character. Hence, hence the beady eye and said long beak. And Which so these, <laughs> and the reason they're called tremblers, they actually have behavior the way they essentially, well, they tremble. It does what it's just what it says, it says in the name. Yeah, they kind of sat in the trees and they just kind of shiver, which was quite weird. It was a display method probably. Um, but while we were catching, um, at that site across the river from camp, um, we decided to utilize the bridge. Um, we were quite keen to try and attempt to catch a kingfisher. We knew it would be a 
very unlikely, but we thought we'd give it a go. But having seen the the the, the, the herons, we thought that's possibly more likely. So we set these nets along the bridge, um, and we caught a heron. Well, Hugh caught a heron. Um, we came back from a net round, and we, we did have a few birds, which we've been carried by the students in bags. Um, yeah, I, I saw a heron in the net, and so I had to run to try to get it. Hence the rather soggy looking hue in the photo. Yeah, just um, having to. Yeah, normally we we're careful going through the through 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 the ford, but yeah, I wasn't letting <laughs> heron escape. So these are these are a fairly common species in the Americas, but they've never been ringed on Dominica before. We didn't know what size ring they would take, etc. So basically, had to work out what size ring we would take. Ring it, of course. And yeah, so this was an adult. We couldn't really say much more than that because we just didn't have the have knowledge. We had the books with us to to, to tell, but it was in in active main malts, so maltics primaries, which tends to be an adult thing for this sort of species. And yeah, so hopefully this bird is still alive and well and catching little fish in the rivers of Dominica. Hopefully they obviously um, didn't get to do any field trips there last year. Um, but you know this is the only ringed green heron on Dominica and you can probably see the ring in this picture it's purple um, and that's because these rings were actually intended for the broad-winged hawks um, because they're about the same size so um, yeah we did actually speak to the lodge owner before we left and we're like see you keep keep an eye on that bird um, so yeah so hopefully if they get to go back this year or more likely next year um, we might get a record back and say, oh yeah, that bird's still around, that heron's still flying around, which would be lovely. Um, and yeah, so this is just um, a view of the river, kind of down river when we were finished ringing. Um, so when we finished ringing on that day, uh, that was the Friday of our first week there. Um, so the following day, Saturday was traditionally the changeover day for the students and they would move from the terrestrial ecology camps to the marine ecology camps and they would go and do a week of kind of paddy day diving training and they'd go and do some coral reef surveys and they'd go and go on a whale watching trip and things like that um, so friday we packed up the nets took this lovely picture went back to camp don't know spent the afternoon snoozing or went for a bath bath in the river i don't know we did something friday night saturday morning um it rained Quite a lot. I do to a tropical weather front, front but... moving through. And the next day, I'll see if my mouse can appear. Um, this rock, the very large rock on the extreme left of the river here, is this rock here. Um, and this photo was taken after the river had gone down a little bit. Um, we got up early to go and um, open the nets to catch try and catch birds on our last morning there. And we were supposed to have a group of students join us. When the students, we went to open the nets and we said to the students, you know, join us half an hour later, you get an extra half hour in bed. When we got back, we thought, why aren't the students here? And we could see them the other side of the river having a discussion with the teachers, trying to decide if it was safe to cross because in the kind of 20 minutes we'd spent opening the nets, the river had risen to a point where it was probably not safe. So we gestured to them and said, no, go back to bed. We'll see you later. Um, and we ended up not quite stuck, but had a few hours of isolation ringing birds by ourselves on the other side of the river, um, which was entertaining. Um, this is, again, a comparison photo. Same shot, um, the little bit of rapids uh down here is where that rock just in front of me is um so it got quite high um thankfully the levels is flash flood so the levels did go down again not after too long um and the students were allowed to go out and have a bit of a delayed start to their field work off site and and move camps um and this day we were actually swapping camps ourselves and this is a picture of where the nets were. So the green heron was actually caught near where this big log is. 
so it was the green heron was about here um so again one of the reasons why we didn't keep the nets in this location was in case this happened overnight um because if it had and the nets had been there they wouldn't have been there <laughs> yeah, we would have had to have owed them quite a lot of money to buy new nets. Um, so eventually the river went down and it was safe for us to cross and we moved to our second um, kind of base camp, which was at Pont Casse, which was, like I said, the middle point of the island uh, where all the roads meet. And this is a roundabout. Um, I think this was possibly, there's only about two or three roundabouts on the whole island. Uh, the other two are in Russo itself, which is the capital. Um, so it was quite a novelty to see to see a roundabout and a zebra crossing, which was very bizarre. Um, so we arrived at the second camp and the second uh, base was actually um, a visitor centre for the long distance trail, hiking trail that goes from the north to the south of the island, which there's another slide for in a minute. Um, and it was quite nice because we had an actual roof over our heads rather than being in tents. And when we first arrived, there was loads of phasmids um, hanging around in the buildings. Um, so these three are all completely different species. And having worked at Welsh Mountain Zoo, I have a soft spot for stick insects. Um, so I had the job of kind of holding them and posing for pictures and then releasing them into the greenery. Except that when the chief entomologist arrived and we told her she wasn't best pleased um, because part of her remit is to obviously collect these um, specimens and take them back for identification because they're possibly new species. <laughs> um, so she wasn't exactly happy about that. So we had to, all, all future rescues were had to be done in secret because um, I didn't really want to see the sick insects get pickled. Um, but if anybody is curious to know what we were dealing with, um, if you've watched the recent uh, Natural History Museum program on Channel 4 um, channel or Channel 5, the um, chief entomologist we were working with uh, on the team was actually Dr. Erica McCall McAllister, who is Fly Girl, um, who, yes, was quite a character in that program. And she's exactly like that in real life. Um, brilliant person to work with. But yes, very keen on her insects. Okay, well, so this is just a, a snippet of the kind of the habitation, but also in here, in the in the very middle, is a bird. <laughs> it was a bit nosy, and we did attempt did, did attempt to catch, and that was was these, so a family of the the um, less antillian bullfinches that we showed you earlier. So I've got male on the right, uh, female in the middle, young bird on the left, and yeah, this this was quite clearly a recently fledged youngster. And yeah, the parents are trying to stuff it full of food. Uh, oh, could could mention this actually. So tropical, a lot of tropical. So in kind of temperate environments, a lot of birds produce a lot of eggs and chicks. So they so based hmm. because they tend not to survive very long. Whereas in tropical areas, the birds, even quite small birds, live much longer. So instead of producing lots of chicks all in one go, they tend to only produce one or two, or three chicks chicks a year. So that means that this only seeing one baby is perfectly normal in this part, part of the world for, for even a small bird. So while we were at this uh, base camp, we were just kind of settling in and we had some birds come and visit us. Um, so we had another broad winged hawk, which was sat in this tree for a while and then flew off and that was a regular visitor. And then we also had a red necked parrot um, which is an endemic species. Um, and there's actually two species of endemic parrots on the island. The other one is the imperial parrot, which it so features um, on the flag of Dominica. And yes, the, the native name is uh, Cicero. And um, unfortunately, the redneck parrots are doing quite well um, after the hurricane. It doesn't seem to have affected them too much but the Cicero lives in the more mountainous uh, rainforests. And obviously that was completely wiped out by the hurricane. So it's actually gone into quite a severe decline and there's not that many of them left. Um, unfortunately, we didn't get out very much during our two weeks. We didn't get the opportunity to go and see them. But one of the groups um, that was with us, they did actually see one 
um, on one of the days that they went out um, to an area where they know they're found. Um, but yeah, they're not doing that well, unfortunately. Um, so it'll be interesting to see if they do recover. Um, but yeah, as I said, so the base camp for the second week was at this visitor centre, which is about the halfway point for the Waiti Kabulu E National Park Trail. I've probably completely decimated that. Um, and although I said it goes from north to south and I said that the, the length of the island is only 29 miles, the actual trail is 114 miles long, um, which seems ridiculous, but it kind of zigzags all the way across the island. Um, and it takes, um, if you follow the guidebooks, it takes about 15 days to walk. Um, we did a small section of it on the Sunday, the, the first Sunday that we were at the site um and yeah we only did part of stage five and it took us quite a long time but we decided to walk the trail um and for a national trail some bits were quite good some bits were quite open um and other bits were less well maintained um which obviously is because of the hurricane um there are some areas where there really need to be bridges um so you have the option of if there was a handy log you could walk across then great if not it was a either soggy boots job or take your boots off and walk across and get wet feet um but it was quite an interesting walk hmm. it, it wasn't particularly arduous it was mostly flat a few hills um yeah quite rocky in, in places but we did find this along the way um which again from my zoo days I like reptiles so um this was a clouded boa constrictor um and it was quite sizable it was about five about five foot long yeah. with quite a quite a decent girth on it um so possibly a female um but de again depending on where you look um this might have been an endemic um or it could have been a near endemic um there is certainly there's a few snakes found on the island. Uh, none of them are venomous, um, but yeah, they're they're quite well characterized from the other islands. So probably an endemic. Um, but yeah, this was quite a nice but find. Also, one, one one advantage of this island, the fact many of the islands of the Caribbean, is there are there aren't actually any poisonous, poisonous or venomous creatures present, or for that matter, any leeches or other nasty things like that. So it's the wildlife is relatively benign, apart from the, the ever-present mosquitoes, but they don't particularly carry anything. And even then, when we were there, like we took, we went prepared for mosquitoes, and actually they didn't bother us that much. So um, yeah, it wasn't wasn't too bad on that front. Um, so this is just a picture of the kind of, I suppose, the rainforest um, along the trail. But as Hugh said earlier all of this greenery is actually um from all the climbers and the vines and things that are growing up the trees as opposed to the trees themselves and just the same this was this was taken from the only bridge we found along the bit of the trail um, which was actually over a deep gorge so useful um and yeah, so they have they had obviously been clearing some of the trails. Um, so this was just a sign um, on our way. Uh, we'd almost reached our end point, um, which is to the pool. Um, so yeah, so it just shows that you know the Ministry of Tourism and Urban Renewal were trying their best to kind of make you know improve the kind of management of the trails and things like that to encourage tourists to come back. And this is where we were aiming for. So this is Emerald Pool, uh, which is a UNESCO Her World Heritage Site. Um, and there's quite a lot of these in Dominica. We, we kind of found this one, but we stumbled across a few others as well. Um, you know, deep river gorges, uh, nice waterfall falling into a nice clear pool. Ever present crabs. And this one was doing a little display for us. Uh, and we'd gone with Robert, who was one of the freshwater um, ecologists on the trip. Um, and as always, he had come prepared with a net and a, a tray. So as soon as we got there, he 
took his clothes off and jumped in to go and get some samples, um, which was nice because then the locals arrived. Um, this is obviously a popular um, spot for locals and these guys had all arrived to, the kids were ready to go for a swim and they brought their beers and their crisps and their ghetto blasters and they were obviously here to have a, a bit of a, a weekend day trip. Um, so Rob decided to do an impromptu little engagement exercise showing them all the little critters that were living in the pool um, and I'm not sure if it influenced them but they didn't all get in the water afterwards so uh, I'm not entirely sure if that was because of what Rob had said to them or whether they just hadn't planned on going swimming. So we decided to walk back um, along the road rather than along the trail um, and that took us kind of in the shadow I suppose of one of the other volcanoes uh, which is part of the Morantois Pitons National Park um, <laughs> and uh, this is um, yeah one one of the other volcanoes shrouded in the clouds the kind of the remains of the weather front that had blown in the day before Oh, I'm doing this one as well. So um, this was a local uh, fruit shack um, on the, just on the side of the road. Um, and when you read any of the guidebooks for Dominica, you'll see about you know what what's the food like, and they always talk about fresh fruit and the fact that so much of it is grown there. And I was really excited to try you know freshly grown exotic fruits, um, but the hurricane obviously kind of destroyed a lot of the plantations and a lot of the crops. So most of the fruit that you that we were buying uh, had to be imported in so it was very very expensive so our meals that were provided for us as part of the trip um, featured very little fruit because it is so expensive um, but this little shack was run by a local guy all the produce there was grown on the island and it was like a regular stop off for the students so occasionally the students would come back from a day you know doing entomology or a day doing field work elsewhere and they'd come back with all this fruit and they'd share it around everyone we'd all have a bit of a taster so it was nice to actually go and see it and speak to the guy and actually sample some fresh fruit um pineapples in this country never taste the same once you've had fresh pineapple um because they're artificially ripened um so he had he cut a fresh pineapple open for us for us to eat um, he had a coconut that we could have, there was bananas, there was papaya. Now papaya comes with a health warning, I'm afraid. If you like papaya, fine. We tried the fresh papaya, weren't that keen. Robert, in his infinite wisdom, bought a whole papaya, so we had a bit of his. And he was told that you can eat the whole thing, um, including the seeds, which he did. Um, and they apparently are very good for kind of solving any tummy problems. Um, but the next day and for a couple of days afterwards, he wasn't feeling too great. Um, and it might have been completely unrelated, but yeah, I, I'd be reluctant to go and eat papaya again. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was really nice to see and, and try locally produced fruit and not too far from back at base we found this so this is a scaly bristed thrasher so it's a well it's a relative of the trembler we showed you earlier though it's kind of it's it's based it's a thrush it's kind of large thrush sized and acting just like a thrush mm -hmm. and so these were quite quite visible from the roads at least and we did see them elsewhere as well yeah um and there is actually, there's two species that are found there. There's also a pearly eyed thrasher as well, which is slightly bigger. Um, I think these guys are possibly kind of maybe. Blackbird size. Yeah, maybe a little bit bigger than a blackbird, but yeah, the, the other ones are about field fair size, I think. Um, so on one of the other days, um, we, decided to go for a walk down the road and we found Jacko Falls, which again is a little tourist um, kind of day trip uh, venue. Um, and although the sign isn't particularly exciting, um, I just included this because of all the plants. Because again, all of these plants look like you could buy them in a garden center. Um, all the different types of lilies and um, kind of climbers and all these things. 
so yeah the the botany there is amazing if anybody's is uh really keen on their plants and flowers and things like that um so this was jacko falls again very similar to emerald pool um waterfall coming down into the pool um but we found lots of fish in here which was quite exciting and the fish are all so so say this is a small volcanic island so all the fish have come in from the sea and they basically they've worked their way up 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 the up the rivers and become come freshwater fish but that's that's why they they look like sea fish mm. particularly the the see the yeah the bright the bright blue thing is is a a fish sadly we don't have a decent picture of it but it that is really what it looks like very very vivid and so there was lots of both these species and i think another one as well and in, in this in this little pool yeah. it's also quite a good little swimming pool yeah but also in this in in this little waterfall area was also kind of a bit of a cliffy overhang and we we discovered in here there were there were swifts roosting as well so it's a black swift I've got really cute we got, faces. <laughs> we, we managed to keep quite close. So unfortunately, it was a bit high to well to grab and catch because one of the things we're also interested in is that swifts are quite good at carrying parasites, so flatflies as they're called. And the chances are, even if it wasn't a new species to science, it would still have been a new species for for the island as well. You know, something quite that boring. But unfortunately, it was just a bit out of reach, and the kit was was several miles away anyway. So. Yeah, I don't think a black swift would have appreciated a, a walk back to base camp in a soggy jumper. Um, but yeah, so we let we left them to it. We took some pictures and left them to it. But on the walk back, we also found uh, smooth billed annies, which are a strange cuckoo relative of a mass massive great beak. Was beak, and these these were relatively common in some of the open areas we found. And again, they used to kind of congregate in small family groups as well. So there was usually kind of two or three of them together. And they were quite reasonably vocal. Hmm. Um, you quite often you heard them before you saw them. And yeah, walking along the road, we found um, some interesting plants. So there were some banana uh, plants growing. Um, this one had almost, almost considering going and picking some for, for breakfast. Um, and the large flower, um, if you don't recognize it, this is actually a ginger plant. Um, description. Yeah, and um, the fruit shack sold little bags of dried ginger, um, which one of the students brought back one day and offered round, everybody could have a little nibble of. And I like ginger, but this stuff was really fiery. Um, it was a little bit too too powerful for my liking although you liked it so yeah but they were quite pretty plants this was this was in like almost perfect bloom most of them had gone over so we were quite lucky to find this one um and also along the road we found a crested anole so the picture on the left is the accidentally introduced species of anole <laughs> excuse us the dog's having a sneezing fit um, and uh, the one on the right is the uh, Dominican anole, which is the native species. Um, and basically the crested anoles um, were accidentally introduced um, a few years ago and they are a little bit bigger and they outcompete the native anoles, which is why they're not found in areas where there's people because that's where the crested anoles are now found. Um, and we actually had a herpetologist um, on our staff team who was actually studying these these species um, and monitoring what where they were found and kind of how how each species was doing for I guess for future research she was part of a PhD or something wasn't it uh, master's master. of PhD so yeah. I think she's now doing them as part of a PhD so um, and as Hugh said earlier, um, when the hurricane hit, it was absolutely devastating. And a lot of the buildings um, were destroyed or, or severely damaged. Um, now we don't know if the two buildings at the top were complete or whether they were in the process of being built when the hurricane hit, but clearly, you know, a couple of years after the hurricane, 
they hadn't been touched. Um, you know, you can see that they were still boarded up. The one on the left actually had a massive tree growing through it. It was like a it was like a very elaborate tree house. Um, so I would love to have seen what the plans were for that one. And, you know, maybe if they ever finish it, go back and have a look at it. Um, the one at the bottom, um, we're not sure if anybody was actually living in there. It looked like they could have been living there. Um, and there was a dog outside who uh, made his presence felt and barked at us to stop us from uh, obviously stopping too long on and taking pictures on the side of the road. Um, but yeah, so this just shows kind of some of the human impacts of the hurricane as well as obviously t wiping out all the trees as well. Um, but back on the trail and back into the almost birding pictures, um, it helps to look up sometimes. Um, I don't think we look up at the canopies often enough. And it was really interesting um, just to get different pictures of what was up above our heads. And sometimes when you look up, you see something exciting. Um, so this is actually a pair of red-necked parrots. There's one in the middle and then there's one slightly to the right to the bottom next to that big branch. Uh, get the mouse just down here. Um, and this pair were quite curious and they would be a fairly common occurrence. Uh, this was near one of our um, kind of bases near the nets um, along the, the net ride. Um, and inevitably they would always turn up just before the students arrived um, but on this occasion the students were actually there um, so that was quite nice the students actually got quite nice views of the parrots but yes unfortunately they weren't low enough for us to get a proper picture showing the red neck um, so you'll just have to trust us on that or look in the guidebook but yeah so so like like the other place we also did did ringing along along the along the a transect in this case along the trail itself, and stop doing <laughs> and yeah. So so the habitat here was a bit different. So this was kind of this was higher up the hills at the mountains, and it was more open naturally anyway. But it also it, it was also had been pummeled by the by the hurricane, but. The razor glass hasn't taken over, and so there were more actually more birds up here, relatively speaking, in the rainforest itself, which included more of the more of the black whiskered vireos. So as, as I said before, the red the red eyed one is the adult, the sort of the brown eyed one is a juvenile. But also we encountered some of our other hummingbirds, or the other hummingbirds there, in this little summer. So this is a Antillian crested hummingbird. Um, and is specifically the Southern Lesser Antillian race. Um, and that's because it has a, the males have this gorgeous kind of blue uh, crest, whereas the Northern race has a green crest. So uh, hand to tip if you're ever out there and you don't know which one it is. Um, and the one that looks kind of nothing like the, the male is because it's a female. Um, so the picture in the top right there, um, this is actually a female and she looks nothing much like the male um you know as always the males are usually quite flashy um the female looks a little bit not quite as smart um which meant that kind of the following net ride uh net round when we went back to the nets and we found this little one initially we thought it was probably the same one but we thought we'll take it back and show the students because we've not had many hummingbirds here so you know gives them a chance to see see another one and then we realized looking in the book because we gave the students the book to for them to try and identify what we'd caught um we realized that the beak wasn't quite right and then we realized that actually the tail didn't quite match the book although there weren't any particularly good illustrations of that which so that didn't help us <laughs> Um, and then we looked again and we realised that this is actually a blue headed hummingbird, which was the fourth species of hummingbird um, that you find in Dominica. And this one's actually one of the rarest. Well, this is the rarest hummingbird, probably other than the, the imperial parrot. This is possibly one of the rarest birds on the island. Um, and this one is a near endemic as well. It's only found here and St. Lucia? No. Uh, no. Or Luke or Martinique? 
Martinique. This one's Martinique. Um, so uh, this one's only found in Martinique and in Dominica. And of course, because Dominica got hit by the hurricane and it wiped out its kind of preferred habitat, uh, this one's doing, well, we, we think <laughs> we think it's doing quite badly. It was never particularly common to start off with. Um, and since the hurricane, there have been very few reports of it. So it was really, really cool um, to catch one and to kind of confirm that we had that was where it was. Um, so although we weren't ringing these birds, um, we did take some measurements of this to kind of prove that it was that species, um, which was which was quite nice. And this was definitely kind of my bird of the trip, even if we weren't allowed to ring it. Even though Hugh says it's not that fancy because it's a girl. <laughs> Um, so the last bird that we ringed of the trip had to be a banana quit. I know, because um, because they were the most numerous uh, birds that we had. But on our last day there, we were actually allowed to get out, um, and we joined the students on a geology trip um, because being a volcanic island, there is lots of interesting geology. Um, so we went to the coast and we spent some time looking well we spent a lot of time looking at rocks um so these are some schist um kind of outcrops um along a, a river valley uh which has actually been quite heavily um kind of mined or or quarried um, quarried, quarried to build the roads um, and buildings yeah sand and gravel and things like that but there was an iguana hanging out on the rocks, um, which was quite nice. Um, relatively small. I, I expected them to be bigger. I thought this one was quite small. No. In the picture, this is cropped. It, it, is it quite was quite small. big. <laughs> it was quite far away. Okay. <laughs> high up. Is this near far away thing yeah. again? Okay. Um, but there were uh, some birds around as well. So this is a grass quit um, doing what they do, skulking around in the bushes. And then we hit the coast. Um, and I really felt sorry for the geologist because he was busy talking to the students about the rocks behind us on the cliffs. And I was across the road taking pictures of all the birds that were uh, visiting these fishing boats. Um, and some of you might know from the photos and apologies, there is a dark smudge in these, which we discovered when we got home. In, there was a mark on the lens um but most of these are frigate magnificent frigate birds but there were some pelicans as well um so this is a brown pelican flying overhead we never actually figured out the age of this one probably could from the molts yeah quite an adult anyway um but yeah so the magnificent frigate birds um were magnificent <laughs> and um we've got a male on the left here unfortunately they were quite distant and they weren't really coming in very close for photos but there was lots and lots of juveniles which were um characteristic because they've got a kind of completely white head and they've got white kind of running all the way down their bellies um interestingly we didn't get any pictures and we didn't remember seeing any females which have got a black head which possibly means that they were all on their breeding grounds in Antigua. Um, and actually, when we flew out to Dominica, we flew via Antigua and had about an hour and a half stop over in the airport. And we did actually see frigate birds through the grubby windows of the airport. So, yeah, possibly. Possibly. And these, these, aren't, these aren't juvenile juveniles. They are probably two or three, two or three years old. Some of them had started to molt into a darker kind of markings um so when we stopped we went a little bit drove further along the coast and we stopped at an area called saint joseph's um and the locals were all out playing cricket and we actually had to stop the students from going and joining them because a lot of the students were very sports orientated and wanted to go and teach the the west indian teenagers how to play cricket <laughs> yeah we didn't think that would do too well for relations so um, we managed to put them on the beach and distract them. Um, so yeah, so there was frigate birds uh, kind of fishing and picking up scraps off the beach. And there's not many people that can say they were photobombed by a frigate bird, right? Um, I had to include that one. 
but yeah it was it was nice to get down to the beach and swim around in in the caribbean sea um which was lovely um and then after that we got back into the buses and we drove down to russo which is the capital and then we drove up um the titu gorge which is the the gorge where we started our hike to boiling lake um but this time we went a slightly different route and the first stop took us to some hot springs hot spring so sometimes they build a pool this is just it, a, a short video of oh. essentially boiling lake in miniature it's um but yeah very very strong sulfur smell not not particularly pleasant you couldn't stand there for too long um but after this we made it all the way up to trafalgar falls um which is two falls the picture in the middle is is of the uh the larger of the two and we're slightly soggy because we actually walked um kind of with a guide all the way up the bank here with the students and the staff that were on that trip and there's a hot spring that comes out about here just behind these rocks and there's a little pool and it's basically like sitting in a bath and it's lovely but the water coming down down the falls is freezing cold um because it's coming off the mountains i'm saying it's freezing cold i didn't like it um so yeah so that was really really nice a really novel way to kind of end our time on dominica um and yeah i it was quite nice. I, I definitely got to Trafalgar Falls again. Mm. Um, you do need to have a guide if you want to go up and kind of swim in the in the pool itself. Um, but there's loads of things to see in the area as well. It's kind of a little bit of a tourist hotspot. Um, so because this is bird grip, we put together a, a list of birds that we'd seen in Dominica in our time there. So I think that's about 30 odd there. Because in the island is has it's kind of normal bird lists, only about 65, 70. Not, not too bad as showing, given we didn't actually get out that much. We did ring, ring a few of them as well. So the ones with the little stars are the species that we caught, that we caught, because obviously we didn't ring the hummingbirds. Um, but yeah, so it was, it was a really good trip. Um, and yeah, thanks for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Susan and Hugh. That was great. And um, uh, I particularly like that uh, black swift you've got behind the water. <laughs> very smart. Yeah, I think, I think that's a sweet little face. Yeah, but I think it's a hard bird to see like anywhere in its range. I think it's um, Yeah, it's they were really quite cat. common to see up there somewhere. But yeah, yeah I just... Yeah, we just stumbled upon these two resting 